I want to begin by saying welcome. Uh, I'm Suzanne Conklin Akbari, and it's my very great pleasure to be doing some of the local arrangements to bring together Sarah Hernandez and Diane Wilson um, in what I think is going to be a wonderful lecture, response, and conversation. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm also grateful to be um, living and working on Lenape land and to have the opportunity to be working with um, uh, friends and colleagues from many of the different Muncie speaking communities across what's now the US and Canada. And just would invite everybody to, to be reflecting on their, their, the land beneath their feet. Even if there's a floor between your feet and the land, the land is under you. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, celebrating as well as listening to um, the sharing of parts of Sarah Hernandez's wonderful new book, We Are the Stars. And some of you will already be somewhat familiar with it. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity to hear Sarah herself open up the book and maybe point in some future directions. Um, I'd just like to say a couple words of housekeeping and say a little bit about how the time will be organized before turning things over to my friend and colleague, Nahir Otaño Gracia, who will be doing the introduction of Sarah. Um, so we'll hear from Nahir briefly and then from Sarah for about maybe 40 minutes or so. And then I'll introduce Diane Wilson, who will respond to Sarah. And then there'll be a conversation between the two of them before opening up that conversation a little bit more widely to bring in the rest of the group. Um, we're able to use a meeting format for this Zoom rather than a webinar format, which is wonderful in the sense that it means when people ask questions, we can see each other's faces, hear each other's voices. So when the conversation widens, you know, you can use the raised hand uh, function or, or raise your hand if I, as long as I can see you in the, in the box. Um, some people may prefer to use the chat and that's totally fine too. And I'll keep an eye on that and raise any comments or questions that come in that way. Um, and so we'll have probably about 20 minutes or so for that part of the conversation with the whole group. And the one downside of the meeting format, as you all know, is that if you leave your microphone on and your dog comes in or your child comes in or the, you know, repairman comes, um, we'll all hear it. So if you could remember to keep your microphone off, if you're not using it, that would be wonderful. And I think that's all the housekeeping things. Let me invite Nahir now to do the introduction of Sarah Hernandez. Thank you so much, Susan, for inviting me here to um, introduce Sarah. I don't think I can express how much this means to me. I also want to thank everybody for coming and expressing your support uh, to Sarah. So thank you very much. It is my greatest honor to introduce to you Sarah Hernandez, a member of this Tishangu Lakota Oyate an assistant professor of Native American literature and the director of the Institute for American Indian Research at the University of New Mexico. In fact, Sarah and I began our tenure at the University of New Mexico in 2019, becoming a cohort of two in our department and working together towards fulfilling our goals. In this way, I feel I have been witness to something amazing, how we can create scholarship that centers community and community building. Sarah just recently published her book, We Are the Stars, Colonizing and Decolonizing the Osheti Shakowin Literature Tradition, which recenters women and their roles as the Osheti Shakowin culture keepers and culture bearers, all the while critically examining the US as a settler colonial nation. At every step of the process, Sarah centered her com communities and made sure that her work was true to Osheti Shakowin traditions. Sarah is also a member of the Oak Lake Writer Society, an Osheti Shakowin led nonprofit for Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. Together, they launched Native Reads, a community based reading campaign and podcast series to increase knowledge and appreciation of the Osheti Shakowin literary tradition. Although these efforts benefit us all by creating access to the depth, depth and wealth of literary materials already produced, and being created by the Osheti Shakowin, the Osheti Shakowin, these efforts are meant to inspire and continue to grow the Osheti Shakowin literary tradition. And I am blown away. I am blown away by Sarah's commitments to her communities, including the Diné and Pueblo students that walk through UNM feeling empowered, in part because of her, 
her commitment to her colleagues who she continually centers through her dedication to the Institute for American Indian Research, her commitment to Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers, whose art she constantly highlights. I would like to end by expressing my deep gratitude to Sarah. I am so grateful to have Sarah as my colleague at UNM and grateful to be able to see how carefully and critically informed research that centers our commitments to our communities better us all. And this is what Sarah does. She makes the University of New Mexico a better place. And with this, I give you Sarah Hernandez, who will be giving a talk uh, titled, We Are the Stars, Honoring Our Literary Ancestors. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank you for that kind of introduction, Nair. Um, and I want to thank you for supporting my work and not just my work, but the work of so many women of color. Um, I also feel really fortunate to have you as a colleague here at UNM. Um, in our department, Nair always talks about the importance of solidarity in academia. And she talks about the fact that academics, as academics, that we constitute a community. And as an academic community, we have a responsibility to come together and to support one another. And so what I really appreciate about Nair is that she doesn't just talk about academic solidarity and supporting colleagues. She truly practices it as evidenced here today. Um, so for example, when I told Nair, you know, after I wrote this book, I said, I don't really know how to promote this book. And she said, I do. And immediately she started reaching out to all of her contacts and her colleagues and encouraging people to, you know, pick up my book and share it with their students. And so I'm just really grateful, um, you know, to have a friend and a colleague who is genuinely committed to building up other scholars and rooting for their success. So thank you for that, Nair. Um, I also wanted to thank Susan Ackberry for organizing this virtual event this evening. Um, so that I could discuss my new book. I also wanted to thank Maria uh, for providing technical support for this event. And of course, I wanna thank our sponsors for this evening for their kind and generous support. This includes the Institute for Advanced Studies and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative at Princeton Universities. Um, I'm really excited to share my new book and to have this discussion about Ocheti Shakuin literature with the amazingly talented Diane Wilson. Um, Diane is the author of The Seed Keeper, which is quickly becoming one of my new favorite books. Um, I think this book is just so beautifully written and it provides so much insight into Dakota history and culture, while also emphasizing the strength and resilience of our people. Um, I taught the Seed Keeper last semester and I'm gonna teach it again um, in the future. So I'm really glad that Suzanne has brought the two of us together um, today to have this important conversation about our literary ancestors um, who have helped you know, pave the way for us and our work. So Diane and I are both members of the Oak Lake Writer Society which is a first of its kind tribal group for Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. Recently, uh, the society became its own 501c3 and changed its name to the Ocheti Shakowin Writers Society. The society was established in 1993 by Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cooklin and South Dakota State professors uh, Charles Woodard and Lowell Amiot. The mission of the society is to organize literary efforts for the purposes of preserving and defending Ocheti Shakowin cultures, oral traditions, and histories, to reaffirm our people's political statuses, and to transform representations of such that are inaccurate and damaging. Every summer for the past 30 years, the Ocheti Shakowin, every summer for the past 30 years, Ocheti Shakowin writers would gather together for a week-long writing retreat and we would discuss and write about Ocheti Shakuin cultures, languages, literatures, histories, politics, and sovereignty. Um, this tribal writers retreat provides an intellectual and a creative space for Ocheti Shakuin writers to explore and express issues and ideas that are relevant to our tribal communities. Over the past 30 years, the society and its summer tribal retreats have been instrumental in helping elevate voices like mine, 
um, and Diane's and so many other Dakota, Nakota and Lakota writers and scholars. Uh, my book, which I consider to be a community-based project, wouldn't have been possible without the guidance and support of Liz and Chuck and many other charter members of the Oak Lake Writer Society. Um, I only wish that every Native scholar and writer had access to a supportive intellectual and creative space such as this one. Now, before jumping into the book, I wanted to give a quick background about the Ocheti Shakowin for those of you who are unfamiliar with our tribal nation. Um, historically, many of you might know the Ocheti Shakowin as the Great Sioux Nation. Um, we know ourselves as the Ocheti Shakowin Oate, or the people of the Seven Council Fires. The Ocheti Shakowin consists of seven tribes based on kinship, geography, and dialect. And these include the Madakwaton, the Sisseton, the Wapukut, the Waputon, the Yankton, the Yanktone, and the Tetan. Um, these seven tribal bands are categorized into three divisions known broadly as the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize that each of these tribal bands has its own distinct language, land base, and literary tradition that reflect their family and their community's own genealogies, cosmologies, and epistemologies. I am an enrolled member of the Sichangu Lakota Oate. My family, um, the floods and the clombs, are from the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, which is located on the edge of the South Dakota, North, uh, Nebraska border. And often I'm asked, you know, if I'm Lakota, why am I focusing on the Dakota literary tradition in this book? And the answer to that question is really simple. Um, when I began this project, I wanted to start at the very moment that our literary tradition appeared in print. Um, the Dakota Nation, uh, the Ocheti Shakuin tribe that is located farthest east, was the first of our seven sister tribes to encounter missionaries, um, missionaries, and other settlers who immediately began transcribing and transcri translating the Dakota language and literature. These missionaries developed what some scholars still refer to today as, quote, the first Dakota library. Um, in this book, I argue that this library actually became a colonial blueprint that subsequent missionary and secular translators used as a model to also misinterpret the Nakota and Lakota dialects. I argue that missionary translations of the Dakota language set a dangerous precedent that denigrated Ocheti Shakoin star knowledge and supplanted our tribal land narratives with new settler colonial land narratives that ensured that many of our people converted to Christianity and assimilated to the American nation. We are the stars colonizing and decolonizing the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition seeks to honor and celebrate Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota literature. For nearly 200 years, Ocheti Shakuin literature has been shaped and delivered by individuals from outside our tribal communities. In this book, I show that Ocheti Shakuin writers have fought diligently over the past 189 years to protect and defend our intellectual and literary traditions despite significant barriers and challenges imposed by settler society. Elizabeth Cooklin, one of the co-founders of the Oak Lake Re Society, um, has dedicated her life to protecting and defending the Ocheti Shakuin literary tradition. And it was actually Liz who suggested the title for this book. The title of this book, We Are the Stars, alludes to Dakota creation narratives which remind us that Dakota people came from the stars to be on earth. I view this book as a literary recovery project, one that recenters our tribal land narratives to reaffirm our longstanding intellectual, um, cultural, spiritual, and political connections to our ancestral homelands. As tribal people, our oral traditions and the printed texts that have emerged from them have always been a source of strength and inspiration. 
Over the past 200 years, however, the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition has been subjected to several dramatic, often traumatic changes. Our oral tradition has not simply been handed down from generation to generation, from ancient Dakota storytellers to more modern Dakota writers and scholars, um, but rather our oral traditions were intercepted and misappropriated by settler colonizers, such as missionaries, teachers, and government officials um, to bolster the American nation. In this book, I argue that the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition is composed of two separate, often contradictory narratives, tribal land narratives and settler colonial land narratives that have significantly shaped and influenced the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations and the role that women play in tribal society. The cover of this book reflects this dual narrative. Um, and the cover of the book is actually my favorite part of this book. Um, the cover of this book was designed my, by my brother, Ruben Hernandez. And I asked him to design it, um, you know, after I completed this project, I had a very clear vision of what I wanted the cover to look like. And so, as you can see here, the cover of this book is an original piece of ledger art. And my brother, he designed it exactly as I saw it in my head. Um, the reason I wanted ledger art is because ledger art is often a drawing or a painting that's superimposed upon a financial or legal document. While imprisoned in concentration camps, such as the ones constructed after the US-Dakota War of 1862, indigenous artists began using le ledger art to protest US occupation and the exploitation of indigenous land, people, and resources. Today, indigenous ledger art is viewed as a symbol of indigenous resistance and reclamation. So the cover of this book is composed of two separate images, one layered on top of the other. The first is a flawed translation of the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, translated by missionary colonizers, this 1858 treaty stripped the Dakota nation of their ancestral homelands. This treaty is in the foreground as a stark reminder of how the United States as a settler colonial nation appropriated the Dakota oral tradition and the traditional role that Dakota women played in tribal society. They did this in a deliberate attempt to undermine the Dakota nation's intimate connection to their ancestral homelands. Layered atop this mistranslated treaty are three female Ocheti Shakuin storytellers representing the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations. These storytellers are wrapped in shawls adorned with stars representing the knowledge and wisdom of their ancestors. These three culture keepers and culture bearers are a reminder of the Ocheti Shakuin oral tradition and of the strength and resilience of the Beni, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women who have fiercely protected and defended our intellectual and literary traditions for generations to sustain our tribal nations. My book is organized chronologically from 1834 um, to present. It's divided into two parts, obviously settler colonialism and decolonization as indicated by the title. Um, the first part of this book explores colonization and how Christian missionaries use the printing press to increase English language literacy and displace indigenous women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers to delegitimize our tribal land narratives and any claims to our ancestral homelands. The second part of this book focuses upon decolonization and the literary revitalization of tribal land narratives in print form in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Often these efforts were and still are led by Ocheti Shakoin women who have published nearly 100 books over the past century on Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota cultures, languages, histories, and values to preserve and perpetuate our rich intellectual traditions and cultural practices for future generations. Now, obviously, I don't have time to discuss settler colonialism and decolonization um, in depth in this 35-minute presentation, 
Um, but I do want to provide a short snapshot of the Ocheti Shakoing literary tradition. Um, I think this snapshot emphasizes the strength and resilience of our people. So traditionally, the Ocheti Shakoing, like many tribal nations, were matriarchal societies um, that respected women and land as the givers of life and nourishment. However, the arrival of settler colonizers replaced the Ocheti Shakoin's traditionally matriarchal system, honoring indigenous women with an oppressive patriarchal regime that demeans and devalues them. In this presentation, I show how missionaries and other settler colonizers have misappropriated the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition. Displacing Ocheti Shakoin women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers and severing our connection both ideologically and territorially to our ancestral homelands. As an example, I focus on the Dakota na Nation. Efforts to linguistically colonize the Dakota oral tradition began in earnest in the early 19th and 20th centuries when Congregationalist and Presbyterian missionaries invaded Minishota Makoche, or the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds that is Dakota Territory or present day Minnesota. Three missionary families, the Riggs family, the Ponds and the Williamson families have long been romanticized in Minnesota history. They have been praised for helping quote, civilize and Christianize Dakota people and for helping establish Minnesota statehood. In this chapter, I examine how these three missionary families use translation and the printing press to internally and externally colonize the Dakota nation. Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang define internal colonialism as the process of supplanting laws and epistemologies with Western beliefs and values. As demonstrated by this quote here, Reverend Stephen R. Riggs was very clear about his intention to internally or linguistically colonize the Dakota nation. He explicitly states in his memoir that, quote, the labor of writing was undertaken as a means to a greater end, to put God's thoughts into their speech, end quote. Riggs and his missionary colony colleagues devoted their entire life to transcribing and translating Dakota language and literature. Um, in my book, I show how these missionaries deconstructed the Dakota oral tradition story by story, sentence by sentence, word by word, and letter by letter, so that they could reconstruct and revise our tribal land narratives to reflect a new settler colonial land narrative that privileged the American nation at the expense of the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations. For time's sake, I'm not going to examine each one of these texts here. Um, however, I do want to note a recurring theme that I noticed among all of these translations, which is that missionary colonizers often describe Dakota language and literature as an inferior knowledge system that was rapidly nearing extinction. This is perhaps most evident in the missionaries' translation of the Dakota of Dakota creation narratives. Um, According to Dakota oral histories, Dakota people came from the stars and emerged from the water at specific sites at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. This site is known as Badote. In 1851, missionary colonizers retranslated these creation narratives, calling them myths or legends. And they did this on purpose to undermine the Dakota nation's longstanding connection to a place that missionaries and other colonizers coveted for themselves. I argue that by dismissing this creation narrative, these creation narratives and calling its legitimacy into question, missionaries and other settlers were able to undermine any ethical or legal connections that Dakota people had to their ancestral homelands. So after mistranslating the Dakota creation narrative, missionary colonizers boldly proclaimed that Badote, the place of the Dakota people's first creation, would, quote, one day prove to be the center of the United States of America. And indeed, today it is. Minnesota is located near the center of the United States. In this chapter, I argue that missionary colonizers not only internally colonized Dakota people by mistranslating their creation narratives, 
but they also externally colonized the Dakota nation by using their newfound knowledge of Dakota language and literature to mistranslate the treaties, like the one on the cover of my book, um, that dispossess the Dakota people of their ancestral homelands. This idea is supported by Dakota scholar Gwen Westerman. Um, she notes that Reverend Stephen R. Riggs used his newfound knowledge of Dakota language to mistranslate these treaties. She argues that he consciously and deliberately misrepresented the terms of these agreements by manipulating Dakota kinship terms, by misinterpreting the word seed and sell, and by adding an addendum to these treaties that helped redirect annuities to fur traders. By misrepresenting the terms of these treaties, Riggs and his missionary colleagues sparked a chain reaction of repercussions, um, including broken treaties, land dispossession, starvation, war, imprisonment, mass execution, and exile that disenfranchised the Dakota nation and deeply traumatized generations of Dakota people. As indicated by the Dakota writers and scholars featured in my book, Dakota people are still working diligently to decolonize their language and their literature so that they could heal from this trauma. Missionary colonizers had a significant impact on Dakota language and literature that contemporary Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people are still grappling with today. Sichangu Lakota elder Albert Whitehat points out that quote, our language was one of the main tools used by the government, the school teachers, and the church for acculturation and assimilation, end quote. So missionaries established the earliest boarding schools in Dakota territory. These boarding schools were dangerous because they hindered Dakota women's ability to fulfill their role as their family, community, and nation's traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. These boarding schools prevented generations of Ocheti Shakoin women from mothering their own children and from sharing their knowledge of their tribe's rich intellectual and literary traditions with future generations. A prime example of this is the published Dakota author Charles Eastman, who was among one of the first boarding school students in Dakota territory. Eastman was educate, educated by the children of the same missionary families that created the first Dakota library. Um, at boarding school, Eastman learned under Alfred Riggs, the son of Reverend Stephen Riggs, who was on the previous slide, and the son of John Williamson, the son of Reverend Thomas Williamson. At boarding school, missionary colonizers used, quote, the first Dakota library um, developed by their fathers as a key linguistic tool to replace the Dakota oral tradition with the American literary canon. According to Eastman, this new generation of missionary colonizers became his greatest teachers and mentors, supplanting his grandmother as his primary caregiver and educator. And I think you see this reflected in this quote that I have here. As Eastman recalls in this quote, um, Dr. Riggs gave me a little English primer to study. Also one or two books in the Dakota language, which I had learned to read in the day school. There was the translation of the Psalms and of the Pilgrim's Progress. I must confess that at that time, I would have preferred one of my grandmother's evening stories. As already discussed, missionary tr missionaries translated and transcribed more than 50 books into the Dakota language, um, including the Pilgrim's Progress, a canonical Christian allegory often regarded as one of the first novels written in the English language. According to Eastman, he devoured every single one of those books in the first Dakota library until, quote, he read all that was published in the Sioux. Often these books told Eastman and other native students that their people were morally and intellectually inferior. Without a doubt, this book negatively shaped and influenced Eastman's perception of himself and his community. It took him a lifetime to overcome the, these missionary teachings. Um, in chapter two of my book, I explicate Eastman's three autobiographies, Indian Boyhood, From the Deep Woods to Civilization, and The Soul of the Indian, to show how Eastman's perception of the missionaries and the church changed throughout his lifetime. When Eastman first began writing and publishing, his critiques of settler society were subtle and indirect. 
However, by the time he penned The Soul of the Indian in his late 40s, he had no trouble explicitly condemning, quote, the fur traders, the black robe priests, the military, and finally the Protestant missionaries for the disintegration of the Indian nations and the overthrow of their religion, end quote. During his lifetime, Eastman personally witnessed and experienced this disintegration numerous times from the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 to the 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, where he tended to his injured and dying Lakota relatives. Throughout the soul of the Indian, Eastman explicitly criticizes missionary colonizers for displacing Ocheti Shakuin women like his grandmother from their traditional role in tribal society as culture keepers and culture bearers. In the soul of an Indian, Eastman unequivocally states, quote, Dakota women ruled undisputed and were a tower of moral and spiritual strength until the coming of the border white man, the soldier and trader. When the Dakota women, when Dakota women fell, the whole race fell with her, end quote. Eastman suggests that the only way to reunite the Ocheti Shakoin is to recenter Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women in tribal society and empower them to, quote, repeat our time hallowed tales with dignity and authority so as to lead us into our inheritance in the stored up wisdom and experience of our race. During his lifetime, Eastman did his best to reclaim and reimagine his grandmother's tribal land narratives as print literature. He published 11 books about Dakota language, culture, and history, and he helped lay the groundwork for future literary decolonization efforts. However, given the time period that Eastman was born in, um, he often faced a number of challenges from settler society that prevented him from fully embracing his grandmother's teachings. In this book, I argue that decolonization is a long-term process that has taken and will take many generations to achieve, um, as, demonstrated in the, uh, as demonstrated by the next few authors in this presentation. Um, each of the authors showcased here build upon, builds upon the effort of the writer who came before him or her so that they can also start to decolonize their language and literature. So um, in my book, I also focus on Ella Cara Deloria. Um, born in 1889, Ella Deloria is often known as the first Dakota anthropologist and linguist. Her personal and professional goal was to reclaim and revitalize the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition for future generations. Today, many indigenous and non-indigenous scholars theorize that Deloria used her anthropological and linguistic training to reimagine this traditional role in a more modern in a more modern tribal context. So for more than a decade, Deloria worked with famed anthropologist Franz Boas and his colleagues um, to correct and retranslate a, a thousand handwritten manuscripts produced by the Riggs and Pond families. In addition to translating these manuscripts, Boaz asked Deloria to conduct her own field research by interviewing 49 Ocheti Shakuin storytellers to, ver uh, to verify the content of these early missionary translations. So from 1927 to 1974, Deloria collected more than 30 file boxes of interviews, reports, and notes on Ocheti Shakuin language and literature. While conducting this research, Deloria began to no notice a number of discrepancies between the printed transcript she read and the oral tradition she heard from her elders. She expressed these concerns to Boaz, who largely dismissed them as minor and insignificant. However, as indicated by this quote here, um, these discrepancies frustrated and nagged at Deloria. She says, quote, I can't just consult native informants translate their contributions and let it go at that. Almost always I know something in addition or some more of the same thing not touched on by other anthropologists. And I must include that too, end quote. Um, in the third chapter of my book, I argue that after Boaz died, Deloria developed her own unique literary translation method to decolonize Oche the Ocheti Shakuin literary tradition and to recenter women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. 
Um, in chapter three of my book, I outlined Deloria's new innovative translation method by comparing her translation of Fallen Star to Riggs's colonized translation of Fallen Star. So Deloria's professional correspondence with Boaz indicates that she noticed a number of linguistic and cultural inaccuracies in Riggs's translations. Um, although Boaz encouraged Deloria to correct Riggs's grammar and syntax, he didn't allow her to address any of the cultural inaccuracies that she observed in Riggs's translation. Rather than critically interrogate any of these cultural discrepancies, Boaz um, republished Riggs's flawed translation in 1941 with little to no changes. While looking through Deloria's archive at the Dakota Indian Foundation in Chamberlain, South Dakota, I found her personal translation of Fallen, Fallen Star. And I noticed that she had corrected a number of these cultural inaccuracies herself. Um, so just for a little bit of context, I'll give you a brief summary of Fallen Star. Um, both the content in Riggs and Deloria's version of Fallen Star is very similar. This oral narrative is about a young woman who marries a star. She becomes pregnant. She falls through a hole in the sky. She plummets to earth and she gives birth to a, a baby boy that she names Fallen Stars. Now it's important to note that Riggs and Deloria, um, the content of the story is basically the same. However, Riggs and Deloria both add subtle um, and subtle details that significantly alter the context and the meaning of this story. So for example, Riggs's translation is relatively short. It's only four pages long. And in his translation, he vilifies uh, women, blames them for the fall of man. Um, and in many ways, Riggs's translation, uh, which is filtered through a Christian lens, recasts fallen stars parents in the role of Adam and Eve. However, when you compare Riggs's and Deloria's translation side by side, you quickly notice that Deloria's translation is nearly four times longer than Riggs's translation. It reflects a more tribal worldview that emphasizes the importance of the Dakota kinship system and acknowledges that Dakota women and acknowledges Dakota women's traditional role as their tribe's culture keeper and culture bearers. The settler colonial spin that Riggs gives to his narrative isn't surprising, right? After all, he was an Episcopalian minister determined to quote, put God's thoughts into their speech. And in many ways he succeeded in that mission. His biblical reinterpretation of Fallen Star has been published numerous times over the past 140 years, including in 1881, 1883, 1941, 1977, 2004, and most recently 2015. Meanwhile, Deloria's literary translation of Fallen Star, which you can tell by this hand-drawn uh, cover, has never been published or seen the light of day. Um, in this chapter, I argue that privileging Riggs and over Deloria as an authority on the Dakota literary tradition is troubling, not only because of the many cultural flaws inherent in Riggs's translation, but also because this is just another iteration of settler colonialism. The United States as a settler colonial nation is founded on the misogynistic practices of silencing and oppressing Ojeti Shakowin women. Because Riggs and Boas were often viewed as experts on Dakota language and literature um, instead of Dakota people themselves, Deloria often had difficulty publishing during her lifetime. Given her difficulty publishing these translations, it was often difficult and at times nearly impossible for Deloria to reclaim and decolonize the Ocheti Shakuin liter literary tradition fully and on her own terms. However, as I argued in the previous um, chapter of my book, decolonization is a process and Deloria was a resilient and a resourceful woman. Um, she wasn't able to publish and distribute her translations in print form, but she frequently traveled across her ancestral homelands, sharing her knowledge with both native and non-native people. These efforts empowered her to share her immense body of work with her community. 
So in this chapter, I argue that Deloria blazed the path for future Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women to follow. Now, most recently, contemporary Dakota scholar Elizabeth Kuklin um, recalls hearing Deloria speak when she was younger, and she cites Deloria as a major influence on her own poetry, prose, and scholarly research. Now, I've mentioned Elizabeth Cooklin a couple of times in this presentation. Like I said, Elizabeth Cooklin is the co-founder of the Oak Lake Writers Society. She has devoted much of her academic career to developing Native American studies as a legitimate academic discipline. Over the past four decades, Cooklin has published more than a dozen NAS-related books, as well as countless journal articles and book reviews. Cooklin is a mixed genre writer known for her sharp mind and tongue. She writes boldly in defense of the Ocheti Shakowi and is unafraid to critique settler colonial violence and oppression, especially when it is directed against Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women. In her 2007 speech, Decolonization of American Indians, Cooklin reiterates that, quote, one of the pragmatic realities of enforced colonialism is that settler misogyny challenges the power status of women and leads to the dogged dispossession of women's rights. As mentioned in this lengthy quote here, um, which I'm not going to read out loud for the sake of time, Cooklin attributes these colonized non-tribal beliefs about male privilege and white supremacy to those Christian missionaries um, I discussed at the beginning of, these, of this presentation. Cooklin, in both her fiction and nonfiction, seeks to challenge these non tribal ideologies by recentering women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. She writes that decolonization and healing can only, quote, originate from oral traditions that have guided Dakota people for millennia and will continue to do so until the end of time. In this chapter, I argue that Cooklin often uses her fiction and her poetry to reimagine the tribal land narratives that she heard in her youth. She reimagines them in a more modern form as print literature, which is an empowering act of indigenous resistance, especially when we consider the fact that Riggs and his missionary colleagues insisted that our oral traditions were gonna quote, go the way of the Buffalo. In other words, our literary traditions were going to go extinct. However, despite war, exile, boarding school, and a number of other harsh assimilationist policies intended to extinguish our language and culture, our oral traditions did not simply just go away. As demonstrated by Cooklin and Deloria and Eastman and many, many other Ocheti Shakowin writers and scholars, our oral traditions are still alive and well today in oral form, in print form, and even in a new electronic form. Although Cooklin's fiction and nonfiction emphasizes the importance of reclaiming and decolonizing the oral tradition, she also suggests that it is time to move beyond literary decolonization to literal decolonization. Like Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, Cooklin is adamant that, quote, decolonization is not a metaphor. Therefore, she has taken steps to active, to literally decolonize the Ocheti Shakowin literary tradition. Toward this goal, Cooklin co-founded the Oak Lake Writers Society. Since its inception, Cooklin has served as the society's mentor, providing writing instruction and offering culturally relevant feedback on her work. These efforts allowed Cooklin to help increase the number of Ocheti Shakowin writers and scholars presenting and publishing in our ancestral homelands so that we can change anti-Indian narratives about our people and communities. Because of the society, many Ocheti Shakowin writers have published full-length books over the year, um, including myself, right? Um, so it was only after researching and writing We Are the Stars that I truly began to understand and appreciate how many obstacles our literary ancestors had to overcome to protect and defend our rich literary traditions. Writers like me, um, like Diane, and like so many other members of the Oak Lake Writers Society 
stand on the shoulders of many Ocheti Shakuin writers, of the many Ocheti Shakuin writers and storytellers who came before us. Um, their literary le legacy reminds us who we are, where we come from, and what's inspected of us, um, so that one day we ourselves might be able to carry these lessons into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. I really learned a lot. I was deeply moved by the ways in which you told us both the very bitter account of the impacts of settler colonialism and also the, um, the account of how over generations that work of decolonization takes place, um, bringing together generations. So I was really moved by that. And I think everybody else was too. Let me um, introduce Diane Wilson very briefly, um, and then we'll hear her response. Diane Wilson is a writer and educator who has published four award-winning books, as well as essays in many publications. Sarah has already mentioned um, Diane's wonderful novel, The Seed Keeper, which came out in 2021 and received the Minnesota Book Award for Fiction in 2022. Her most recent publication is a picture book called Where We Come From, co-written with three other authors, which was released just this past October. One of the things I admire very much about Diane Wilson's work is the way she meets readers where they are, K through four readers in the case of where we came from, and middle grade readers in the case of her biography titled Ella Cara Deloria, Dakota Language Protector. Her biography of Ella Deloria was an honor selection for the 2022 American Indian Youth Literature Award. She's also the author of a memoir called Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, as well as the nonfiction book, Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life. I look forward to Diane's response to Sarah's lecture and the conversation that they'll share before we open up to questions and comments. Diane? Mm. Amitakiapi. Thank you, Suzanne. It's such an honor to be here, to be in conversation with Sarah Hernandez around her just impressive and thought-provoking new book, uh, and I just want to thank Sarah for taking so many years to put together what is a, a really um, comprehensive look at Ocheti Shakoin uh, literary history. And I have to say that as an Ocheti Shakoin writer, her book gave me much greater clarity around the colonizing process and as well as a deeper understanding about the relationship between oral and written stories, especially within the context of Ocheti Shakoin history and culture. And to me, this is an extremely important book for all Ocheti Shakoin writers and actually readers everywhere, um, and provides a terrific roadmap for other communities to interrogate their own literary legacy. Um, one of the things that Sarah said in her remarks was that each writer she discussed has built upon the, the efforts of the writer who came before. And I, to me, that is exactly what Sarah has done in this work. She has paid close, critical attention to writers like Charles Eastman, Ella Deloria, and Elizabeth Cook Lynn, who have all worked tirelessly to preserve and protect Ocheti Shakoin stories and culture. And at the same time, these writers experienced um, or, or observed firsthand the, um, the impact of assimilation programs, especially boarding schools, and how that affected the Ocheti Shakoin in terms of loss of language, stories, and culture. And I, I wonder sometimes, how much they worried about the danger that presented to the, the viability um, and survival of the Ocheti Shakoin language, culture, and stories. But in each generation, it was, it was writers who um, came forward um, and continued to learn that language and support it and, and preserve it and protect it. And so um, to me, Sarah is one of those writers in the work that she has done, especially in her generation, 
to continue to learn from her literary ancestors and elders um, in a way that makes sure that this work will be carried forward. So thank you, uh, Pidamaya, um, mm -hmm. to you, Sarah, for your hard work um, all these years in, in creating this book. Um, uh, I'm deeply grateful to you. Thank you, Diane. That's so kind of you to say. I um, learned a lot in this process, but I feel like I still have a lot more left to learn. <laughs> yeah, we, I feel the same way, you know, <laughs> even at the, the gray haired stage, um, there's still there's always so much to learn. But I'm, you know, as a writer, I just so appreciated the framework that you provided for for writers about understanding this deeper history and context. Um, and so I have, I just, I have, a, I have questions for you that I'm excited to get to. And um, the first one is really, as a writer, I'm always fascinated about how writers come to um, the any particular work, you know, why this book at this time. And what I was really interested in is what originally inspired you to write this particular book, and then how you chose these three writers to focus on, rather than other well-known Native authors, you know, such as James Welch, for example, who have also done so much for um, Native literature. Yeah, no, that's a, a really good question. Um, this book is, um, you know, a, a, an expanded version of my dissertation project. Um, and I guess I really came to the dissertation project um, even much earlier than graduate school. Um, you know, I did not grow up on the reservation. I grew up in Denver, Colorado. And growing up, I had never read a book by a Native author. Um, I don't think I read a book by a Native author until I was 19 years old and in college. Um, and then I didn't read a book by a writer from my own tribal community until I was 25 years old. And after I started reading some of these texts as an undergrad, I really made the conscious decision when I went into graduate school that I was going to focus on Ocheti Shakuin writers. I wanted to see um, you know, what type of stories, what type of books our writers were producing. And so when I started graduate school, that was a very conscious decision on my part. Um, you know, for my comprehensive exams, I only wanted to read books by <laughs> Dakota, Lakota, Nakota authors. And um, you know, I thought it would, you know, I thought it would simply be me going into the archives, um, pulling up a list of names and reading those books. But it actually pre proved to be much more difficult than that. Um, what I learned really quickly in graduate school is that our books aren't easily accessible. Um, you know, it wasn't just me going into the archives and pulling a bunch of books off the shelves and analyzing them. If I wanted to study the Ocheti Shakuin literary tradition, I actually had to reconstruct um, the Ocheti Shakuin literary history. Um, and so that's really what I spent most of my dissertation doing is just reconstructing um, a genealogy of Ocheti Shakuin literature, compiling all these books, um, reading these different writers, trying to figure out how they fit together. Um, and so in my dissertation, I reconstructed this genealogy, but you know, once I decided to expand it into a book, I knew that I needed to do more than just summarize the Ocheti Shakuin literary tradition. I need to, to, to really analyze and engage with these books. And like I said in my intro, the Oak Lake Writer Society was really helpful in helping me narrow down my ideas. Um, you know, some of the writers said, you know, a recurring theme we're seeing in here is discussions of women and land. And you should really try and explore that and flesh these ideas out more. And so that's what I did in, in the book. Um, and so really, I guess I came to this project out of, you know, out of my own need. These books weren't available when I was growing up. And I, you know, I think it's really important and empowering for our youth to see themselves reflected in their textbooks and in their classrooms. And unfortunately, I didn't have that opportunity. So I knew that when I went to graduate school, I wanted to make these, I wanted to increase access to these books um, so that younger, so that younger generations would be able to read, you know, books by 
writers from their own community. Um, the way that I ended up narrowing in on these specific authors on, um, you know, Eastman, Deloria, and Cook Lynn is, um, is somewhat accidental. Um, like I said in my presentation, you know, people often say, well, you're Lakota, so why are you writing about Dakota writers? And, um, you know, when I started doing this research and reconstructing this genealogy of Ocheti Shakoing literature, I realized that the Dakota Nation was the first of our tribes to have their language and their literature transcribed and translated. And so I began just looking at Dakota, the Dakota Nation. Um, and it, it kind of fell together really nicely. Like once I started looking at the missionaries, I was quickly able to make that connection that they were the ones, you know, who um, were teaching Charles Eastman. And, you know, once I started looking at the missionaries, I suddenly, um, you know, discovered that Ella Deloria had spent much of her life trying to recorrect, trying to correct and retranslate their work. And after I read Deloria, I went to Elizabeth Glynn's archive and I found information in there where she talks about how Deloria influenced and inspired her work. And so it kind of all fell together. Um, and I think it fell together that way because like I said, all of these authors are building on um, you know, the work of the writer who came before them. I don't know if all of these writers consciously knew each other, but I do feel like um, their work was shaped and informed by the work of, of the writers who came before them. And so, yeah, I think when I came to those specific writers, I was specifically looking for Dakota writers who were trying to challenge these missionaries. And Eastman, Deloria, and Cooklin all have done that to some extent mm -hmm. in their own work. And I really appreciate you mentioning too about growing up not having books by um, Locheri Shakoin writers available to read, and that mm -hmm. you had to go out and find authors um, to to fill that gap. And that sometimes as writers, what we do then is write the books that we wish we could have read, we wish um, were available to us as children. So. Again, I, I just appreciate how you are continuing um, to lead another generation into uh, understanding deeply our literary ancestors and elders. So here's another question. Um, your book does a terrific job of explaining how missionary-led efforts to create an alphabetic script in order to publish works of their choosing, led to texts that are, quote, deeply flawed, filtered through a Western Christian lens, unquote. And these works misinterpreted Ocheti Shakoin cosmology, including the concept of God, our relationship to land. It created a misleading comparison of Dakota and Greek mythology, and mistranslated treaties that triggered the 1862 US Dakota War. And I'm wondering if you would just take one of those examples and just share your understanding as it illustrates your broader point about disrupting Dakota star and land narratives. So uh, one example from the book or? Yeah. So any of those, um, you know, I have I was especially caught by the misinterpretation, for example, about the concept, the Christian concept of God as compared to um, an Ocheti Shakoin or indigenous understanding of a creator. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that really struck me when I first started this project is how few scholars were critically interrogating these missionaries and their translations. Um, I read so many historians and anthropologists who really praise these missionaries and called their translations the most authentic or um, the most authoritative representation of the Dakota oral tradition. And so it really struck me that none of them questioned, you know, these missionaries or their Christian biases. They just accepted it and said, these are the earliest and most authentic representations of Dakota language and literature. So that was something that really struck me. Um, when I read the book, because I think any author brings their own background and their own perspective into the work they're doing. 
And so, like I said, Riggs was very clear up front that his goal was to put the word of God into Dakota's speech. And we see him doing that throughout, um, throughout many of his translations. And so one of the, you know, in addition to, you know, um, incorporating these, you know, in addition to translating Dakota oral stories into these like Christian parables, I also thought it was really interesting that he also did that with Greek mythology. I found an article where he matched up every single one of the Dakota, what he called Dakota gods with a Greek god every single one he went back and forth. And so I remember one example he talked about was um, was the god, the Greek god Mars and the Greek god Enya, Eon, I always say that wrong. Um, and he said they're both similar in that they're both um, male gods of destruction. And when I read that, I was like, well, that's not quite right, right? Maybe Mars in Greek mythology is a god of destruction, but Enion is considered a god of creation and rebirth. And he conflated those differences, totally, you know, ignored any differences between that. Um, and again, he did that a lot with, you know, these Christian parables, like I said, with Fallen Star. Um, he just completely, yeah, he completely dismissed any sort of tribal perspective and just um showed them through his own limited Christian Western worldview. And, and he didn't stop there with inserting um, Christian philosophy. He also mistranslated treaties, and that had an, an enormous impact on um, land theft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and that was something I think, um, you know, that was a major component missing between the dissertation and the book. And the dissertation, I only looked at the ways in which these missionaries internally colonized Dakota people by changing some of their oral narratives. Um, and it wasn't really until later when Elizabeth Cooklin kind of pushed me a little bit. She said, well, um, you know, what about, what are the, what are the political consequences of, of these narratives? And um, I thought about that for a long time and I thought really hard. And then as I was doing this research, I began to realize that Riggs and his colleagues were all, um, you know, part of the settler colonial agenda. A lot of them were um, in the Minnesota uh, Congress. Um, you know, a lot of them were involved in writing these treaties. They had knowledge of the language, they had knowledge of the literature, and they used that knowledge um, consciously and deliberately to strip Dakota people of their ancestral homelands. And I guess the irony of all of that is, is that they didn't realize that they had done anything wrong. They had always thought that they were trying to, you know, um, protect Dakota people. Um, and I, I don't know, it just always sort of blew me away that they never that they never even thought about the consequences of their actions or that they, um, you know, that they had such a destructive impact on the Dakota nation. Um, that always just sort of blew my mind. But yeah, like you were, like I was saying, they used the language and the literature to mistranslate these treaties. And Gwen Westerman in particular does a really good job of looking closely at each one of these treaties. And she goes in and she notes that when the missionaries mistranslated these treaties, she says they manipulated Dakota kinship terms. Mm -hmm. She said these missionaries knew how important kinship relationships were to Dakota people. And so they use these kinship terms within the treaty to make it sound like this was somewhat of a friendly agreement, you know, between the U.S. and Dakota people, that it was somewhat of a friendly agreement, that it was um, a temporary agreement. And, um, you know, they did all of this consciously and deliberately. And then she and both Native and non-Native scholars point out that probably the most dangerous thing that they did is then they added a third page to these treaties agreements um, that neither, you know, that the Dakota nation never saw. And these, this third page basically gave annuity rights um, to fur traders instead of native people. So any money that Dakota people were going to receive from their land, more than half of it went to these fur traders who were, you know, waiting to collect that. 
And, you know, Gwen Westerman does a good job of showing, you know, she's a fluent language speaker of showing how the um, missionaries mistranslated the language to, to get what they, get what yeah. they want, which was land. It, it was really, it was really informative to me to see you um, explicate the internal and external forms of colonization between mistranslating stories and mistranslating treaties and then how that all came together um, in such a devastating impact on um, Dakota people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you also wrote, um, well, you quoted Elizabeth Cook Lynn as saying, words are powerful and have consequences, which I love that quote. Mm -hmm. And then you also uh, wove in, uh, you know, these um, traditional stories that you've mentioned also in your in your remarks, Fallen Star and Corn Wife. And so it it felt to me um, throughout the book by being able to also understand these stories more deeply, um, simply by seeing them from, um, for example, Ella Cara Deloria's perspective compared to Riggs and to see where the two, um, how they diverge. But um, in addition to exposing those um, settler colonial land narratives, you also say that this is a lit literary recovery project that recenters women as story keepers of star and land narratives. And so I just wanted to ask, is that how you would describe your work? And what to you is the most important teaching or theme that you hope um, readers will understand from your book? Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely would, um, you know, I would describe this book as a literary recovery project. Like I said, um, you know, I I um, began looking at this in graduate school and before I could really critically engage and analyze with our literary tradition, I had to reconstruct that genealogy about Chitty Shakuin literature. So I do feel like this is a literary recovery project. Um, you know, one thing I learned throughout this entire process is um, that our books aren't readily available. Um, you know, some of these books are out of print. Some of them have never been published at all. Some of them are still buried in archives, right? Um, and so, yes, it is very much a literary recovery project. And I think that there's still so much work to be done um, because I only focus on three writers. And it makes you wonder how many other Ocheti Shakuin writers have their works buried away and hidden away in archives or, you know, that have fallen out of print and haven't been studied yet. So I do definitely think this is a literary recovery project and it's only the beginning. I think there's still a lot more work to be done there. Um, and then I guess the lesson that I learned from all of this, um, I think I learned, I learned so much from all of this. I think for me, this project, um, you know, was my way of learning about our literature and our culture. Like I said, that wasn't readily available to me growing up. Um, you know, like I said, I didn't grow up on the reservation. My parents aren't, you know, traditional, traditional people. My grandparents spoke the language fluently, but they never spoke it to us. And so there was that gap in knowledge, right, for my parents and for my generation. And so this entire project was a way for me to reconnect with the culture and the language and the literary tradition in that way. And so I guess the most, you know, the biggest theme that I see in this book, again, is that idea of women and land and how important, um, you know, women and land are to our tribal communities. As I say in the book, um, women sustain our tribal nations, right? They use storytelling to remind us of our connection to the land and to each other. Um, and so I think that's the biggest lesson that I learned from this project. Um, yeah, so I think I, I learned a lot, hopefully, um, you know, and I hope, like I said, I hope others <laughs> will learn a lot. Like you said, I was writing a book that I didn't have available to me when I was, you know, when I was younger. Well, one of the things that shocked me 
um, in reading your conclusion. So here you are writing this book of a, that's a literary recovery project. And then in your conclusion, you tell us that um, the South Dakota Department of Education has removed more than a dozen references to the Ocheri Shakoin from the state's social studies standards. And can you just comment on that, why that is so? I mean, that was just, that's devastating. Yeah. Um, no, I, no, you know, it really is devastating. And it's, um, it happened near the end of this project. You know, when I was writing this project, I thought we had made a number of great strides. You know, I, um, you know, saw the really important work that, you know, um, a number of people in South Dakota have done over the years to, you um, you know, incorporate Ocheti Shakuin culture and language and literature into our curriculum. You know, the um, Ocheti Shakuin Essential Understandings, the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies, they've all worked closely with, um, you know, teachers and schools in South Dakota to bring our language and our culture and our traditions into the classroom. And then suddenly, you know, in the Trump era, um, Christy Noem introduces this policy to eliminate any references to critical race theory in the curriculum. And suddenly all of this hard work feels like it's been undone, right? Yeah. Suddenly you can't teach Ocheti Shakuin um, language and culture in our schools. And from what I understand, they had their last meeting on all of this in April. The South Dakota Board of Education had their last meeting in April and they finalized the agreement. So in 2025, they will officially erase, right? The, any of references to the Ocheti Shakawain and social studies curriculum beginning in 2025. And so all of that happened uh, very close to when I was um, finishing up this book. And so I added that last chapter. Um, but I think I was as stunned as anybody else. It felt like a big step backwards, right? It felt like a big step backwards. Um, during all of this, I was also working with the Oak Lake Writer Society on the Native Reads Project. Um, and the Native Reads Project, um, I didn't talk about it in my presentation, and I here briefly referenced it, but the Native Reads Project is um, an educational toolkit, which, um, uh, consists of a recommended reading list of 10 books uh, about Ocheti Shakuin culture and language that are critical to our um, to understanding our people and communities. We had hoped we could, you know, um, distribute this and encourage people to teach these books in their classrooms. And then again, suddenly, you know, these policies were passed. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully teachers still, regardless, still teach these texts. But no, it is, it's, it's disheartening. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I so appreciate too what, what the, um, the Oak Lake Writers, now known as the um, Ocheri Shakoin Writers Society, are doing to make sure those, those books continue. Um, so maybe as my last question before we move to Q&A, um, I wanted to ask you, because I think you, well, you'd written that um, I mean, there is this, there is this, this conflict, right? That right, we have writing as a tool um, that we rely on, but it is both a tool and a product of settler colonialism. So what, what advice do you have for writers in navigating this kind of complex literary landscape? That's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah. I still help from writers. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I, I I don't speak the language. I'm not a fluent language speaker, and so English is, you know, the only language that I have to communicate. Um, but I think for me, you know, the biggest um, the biggest saving grace in all of this has been the Oak Lake Writer Society, right? Being able to attend those retreats, and I just feel so lucky that there are so many members of the organization who are just so supportive of my work. Um, even when I wrote this, you know, this dissertation, I asked some of the Oak Lakers if they would read a draft of this and, you know, comment on it and give me feedback. And, you know, they did. And they told me how I could make this better and stronger. And, you know, some of the ideas that I should flesh out a little bit more. And so, I feel really grateful for that organization. Um, you know, I guess 
I guess my advice would be to really uh, listen and learn from, you know, your elders and from the people who came before you. Um, so that's really what I tried to do throughout this process. Yes, I went into the archives and I did a lot of this research, gathering these materials on my own. But then again, I also sought out the advice, um, you know, of the Oak Lake Writers Society and of um, writers and elders who knew a lot more <laughs> than I do, right, about all of this. And I, I tried to listen to them and pay attention to, to some of those, you know, some of those lessons. I guess that's the way um you know that I did it um but yeah I mean the problem is we're still using the colonizers tools right and I guess well I don't guess I know eventually I'll need to learn you know the language myself but that's also going to be a long process and I'm not young anymore <laughs> I, it will, it's all it relative Sarah to do that. <laughs> it will probably be hard for me to do that um but yeah, I think that's just an issue that we all have to contend with is we are dealing with the colonizer's language, but I would say, um, yeah, just be open and listen, right, to our literary ancestors and the people who came before us. I guess that would be my advice. Thank you, Sarah. And I want to I wanna also thank you for writing this very powerful book and sharing it with all of us. And I think at this point, then we turn it over to Suzanne, who will open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah, um, I think Maria is able to make it so we can see everybody all at once, maybe keeping Diane and um, Sarah pinned at the top, that will work great. Um, perfect. If anybody has questions, you can use the raised hand emoji or you can turn on your video and just your actual hand up. I was really struck, Sarah, when you're talking just now about um, speaking the language and thinking about the multi-generational nature of that um, reclamation, you know, that's just so much in keeping with, with the, the larger picture you've been sketching out, that it's not going to happen in a single lifetime. It's going to happen in, over time. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, and I'm probably going to get the name wrong, uh, the, the materials that you said that were never published, uh, the translations that were done that were contrary to uh, uh, Briggs mm -hmm. uh, DeLorean, I'm sorry, I might DeLorean. have her name. Yeah, mm -hmm. are they ever going to be published? Is somebody working on them or looking at them or making them available in any format like digital, I don't know. Yeah, they are available in a digital format on the Dakota Indian Foundation website. They've digitized Ella Deloria's archive there. Um, and then when I wrote an early version of this chapter, I published it in English language notes and they um, they published a copy of Fallen Star uh, informally in that journal as well. But I think the, that's the only place that it's been published. I don't know if other people are publishing on, um, you know, plan to publish Deloria's unpublished collections. But I imagine folks are starting to think about that. Um, you know, it's been a few years now, but they've started to publish, uh, posthum posthumously publish Deloria's work, Water Lily, um, the Dakota Way of Life. And so hopefully eventually somebody publishes this collection of stories, Dakota Legends. Um, I think maybe people don't because there are some of the pages missing from, from that archive, but yeah, hopefully somebody, you know, publishes, publishes it. Thank you. Somebody had asked a little bit about the Native Reads program. And so I just popped um, sort of a general link in the chat. I don't know if um, Sarah or Diane, you want to add a little bit more about Native Reads? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit more about Native Reads. Let me see if I can pull up the, the, um, the educational toolkit that we created. Because so I really am proud of Native Reads. I feel like Native Reads is a condensed version of, um, of the book and of of my dissertation. Um, me and five other members of the Oak Lake Writers Society worked on this project together. Oh, let me see if I can. 
And, and while you're calling it up, Sarah, I'm just um, noticing a comment in the chat from Marsha Tucker, who says, thank you for the talk and, and how heartbreaking it is with regard to the censoring of critical race scholarship and, and all that went with that. Um, thinking about the Native Reads work maybe as a kind of countering uh, 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 response and a, uh, a good way to work back against that. Yes, I hope so. You know, I think, like I said, I think a lot of uh, Native organizations have started to create materials like like this. So I know that, um, you know, we're not the only ones. Like I said, um, the Ocheti Shakawi and Essential Understandings, which is a group of elders who put these materials, put materials together, the Center for American Indian Research and Native Study, they've all, you know, have been doing this work for a long time too. And so I hope that they also continue continue that fight. And so here's the Native Reads brochure, and I believe we put a link to where you can find this, but the Native Reads brochure, um, we put, we picked 10 books, recommended books, um, to learn more about the Ocheti Shakawe. Uh, I don't know. And so uh, some of the authors I talked about in my presentation, you see Ella Deloria, uh, Charles Eastman, Elizabeth Cook Glenn, um, you know, so the Oak Lake writers, basically what we did is we surveyed Ocheti Shakuin citizens and we asked them which books are most important and foundational to our communities. And we use those survey results to create this recommended reading list. Um, as part of this recommended reading list, we um, created this literary timeline. And this is my favorite part of this educational toolkit. Um, you can't see it that well here, but you can see the timeline. We give a little bit of context, historical and cultural context for each one of these books. Um, we talk about how these books, um, you know, reflect important cultural and historical moments um, in our communities. And then in addition to creating this literary timeline, we created a series of discussion guides to go along with each one of these books. And so some of the Oak Lake writers have started book clubs where they'll read these books and they'll, you know, also use the discussion guide questions to um, help guide their conversations. We also created a podcast series through Red Nation Media, um, which was really exciting. This Native Reads project actually launched during the pandemic. And so um, a lot of people didn't hear about it. And so it launched during the pandemic. And so one of our members, Nick Estes, recommended that we do a podcast series. And so what we did is we interviewed um, the author if they were still alive, or we interviewed one of their relatives to talk about the book. And so these podcasts are sort of a supplemental um, tool that you know people can use when they read and study these books. And so the hope is, right, people will use these tools and resources to um, you know, get better acquainted with the Ocheti Shakui literary tradition. But I'm really proud of that project. And like I said, it wasn't just me working on this. It was several of the Oak Lake writers, several who are on online today. I see them, Winiko, Gabby, Patty. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's really great. That's awesome too, in the way that it brings back into the oral domain things that have been, you know, it's not just about written text, it's also about what's heard and, and sp spoken about. Mm -hmm. Podcast mm -hmm. and Laniko Lee also made a comment in the chat saying this presentation is a critical example of building on the strengths and courage of story keepers of our oral tradition when it comes to recovering our Chati Shakoan literary tradition and continued cultural practices. That's a good thought. Um, there's also a comment from Gabrielle Pet. Um, Petiuskanska, I, I lose the end of the name. I'm so sorry. It'll, it cuts off the end of your name. I'm sorry. I don't know if you want to ask your question, Gabrielle, or would you like me to read it? Um, I can read it. Um, um, this is this is Gabrielle. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, uh, I think one of the other considerations besides um, language recovery is the development of an orthography by um, the Ocheti Shakoin, and then the orthography that is being developed today by the University of Minnesota is problematic because it's coming from a settler institution and not from the communities themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a long project 
um, repairing and the harms that were done by um, rigs and the missionaries and then creating an orthography that's acceptable to um, the, di the different dialects, the Nakota, Lakota, and Dakota. And so mm -hmm. that's going to be a, a very difficult and complex long-term project too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I think, um, you know, Gabrielle makes a really, a really good point that um, these efforts need to be community-led, um, right? We can't have settlers constantly telling us how to improve our language or our literature. Um, and so that is one of the reasons I'm so proud of Native Reads is because that was an entirely community-led, community-curated project. Um, I think that's also, you know, the strength of my book, We Are the Stars, is I primarily only cited um, Ochoti Shakwin writers and scholars. I think they were a handful of non-Native uh, historians that I might have quoted briefly, but I really tried to center our own um, language and culture and knowledge. Um, so I think it is really important that all of these projects, regardless of what they are, is that they're community led. Sarah, I have another question. Uh, I see on the cover of your book that the figures are, you see the back of them. And I saw the same thing in, in one of the books that you just showed on the on the other on the other website. Is there a significance to that, that they're not, you don't see the face, but you just see the, the maybe, it's a strength or? Oh, for me, you know, I just, I mainly, I guess you didn't see their faces because I wanted to show off their shawls and I didn't know how okay. to how to make the faces while also showing the shawls at the same time. Okay. So I think that was, yeah. Because okay. we experimented with that, but it didn't look quite right. <laughs> faces are always hard to draw. Yeah. It's an incredibly beautiful cover. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that your brother made it, which must just make it that much more meaningful and and a, and a beautiful, beautiful thing. I yeah, don't know, for me, it needs strength. I mean, it's woman's strength, if anything. Um, yeah. and, and that's why I was asking, because it's it just shows it's like the, the stance of the empowerment. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. And I was really glad my brother could make this. Like I said, I had a very clear vision once I finished the book. I knew that I wanted it to be ledger art and I knew that I wanted women um, over this mistranslated treaty as an act of reclamation. And so I described it to him the way I saw it in my head. And he, yeah, he used the computer and put it together. So I was really happy with it. Beautiful. Any other comments or questions? Well, I, I have one more. Uh, comment because um, I you know I just having spent a good amount of time with uh, with Sarah's book and one of the one of the um, points that I so appreciated was understanding more deeply the connection between oral tradition and uh, written stories and you know in in my own <clears throat> without without really understanding um that that connection before it was it was you could see how the literary written word has been privileged now as really the that's where all the contemporary work is happening but without <clears throat> that connection um back to oral tradition it's kind of rootless and so Sarah, that's one of the one of the points that I I really appreciated was understanding that close relationship and that connection and how really they are um, the written word is an extension of oral tradition and that that it doesn't it it augments it supplements but it never displaces or replaces the oral tradition which is which is really the root and the source of Dakota culture and stories. So thank you for that as well. Yeah, no. Yeah, that was I think that was a big lesson I learned too, uh, while researching this book is just seeing how deeply impacted each one of these writers was by the oral tradition. And that, um, you know, they were each trying to reimagine the oral tradition in these new and creative ways, which I thought was um, 
you know, really admirable for each one of them to do. They didn't do it the same way. They all kind of reimagined these oral narratives in kind of different ways and used different literary devices and rhetorical strategies to do that. But um, they were each, all of their texts were grounded in the oral tradition and yeah. I, I just see that as such a profound lesson for all of us uh, writers working today. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share uh, a thought here and thank Sarah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Lady Go. Um, I just wanted to point out that something interesting reading Sarah's book and all and, and listening to the way in which she's described and explicated all the literature that she has gone through. It, I came away from this realizing that we as a people have been, um, had been physically, um, the goal was to destroy us physically, to remove us. And when we, when that was not successful, the, the insidious nature arose through the church and it was a crafty way of coming together um, with a design to to um, subjugate the people through the spiritual realm i found that your um research sarah has been a revelation to those who think that whatever is printed is not necessarily going to be um, hidden away. We saw that the, your, through, through your careful research, you've resurrected our literary tradition through the voices of those whose um, message was not lost. Thank you, Lemiko. It means a lot. <laughs> I think it's powerful. Um, realization we all have of when it comes to research, how important it is to carefully um, take the time to digest some of the some of the things that we find difficult, but you keep forging ahead. And I think that I want to thank you so much for, for that. Thank you. And I also wanted to thank you. Um, Lenika was one of the people who read, you know, my manuscript and commented on it as well. And so, like I said, I learned so much from, you know, so many of the Oak Lake writers as I put this project together. Um, you know, Gabrielle kindly shared some of her knowledge about Eastman, her, her relative, and, you know, Patty was always so supportive of my work. And so, you know, I, re I really, really appreciate all of this. And I don't know if Chuck is still on, but Chuck was also really, you know, instrumental in just helping me think through this project as well. So like I've said over and over again, I'm just really grateful to the Oak Lake Writer Society and, you know, to the fact that we have this platform where we can come together and talk about these issues. It might be a beautiful thing to end on. I really was so happy to, to hear the two of you speaking both as members of that Writers Collective from your different perspectives and centering that conversation on Sarah's amazing book, which I think is just gonna have more and more impact um, as, as the months and years go by. Oh, um, thank you again for putting this together, Suzanne. I really appreciate it. It was a really small thing to do. I'm, I'm thankful for um, uh, Nahira for, for, for first introducing me to your work, Sarah, and to Maria for organizing us and to all of you for being here. Um, thank you so much, um, Diane, and thank you, especially Sarah. Thank you.